Good evening. Can you hear me? No. Can you hear me now? Okay. Thanks, Peter. <clears throat> and thanks, boy. It's nice to see so many friends here tonight. Thank you for coming. And um, I love talking about Gunnar's work, and I love doing that with friends. And it's nice that you can talk about him and show some paintings. And uh, I know a few of you have maybe seen uh, a version of this talk. Um, I've already done it a few times in association with the exhibit at the museum. But I have some new work to share with you tonight, and that's kind of an exciting addition. I, uh, I first became aware of Gunnar Biedforsch's work in 1976 when I first moved to the Grand Canyon. And I bought a copy of that book by the Belknaps from my mother, who's also a painter. And before I gave it to her, I read it cover to cover and absorbed the paintings as best I could. And I uh, immediately fell in love with Gunnar's paintings and his style and his obvious love for his subject, the, the landscape of, of the West. And since that time, he's been one of my heroes. And I, I think to some extent has influenced my painting, and a lot of my artist friends have been very influenced by his painting as well. So it's so just a, a great pleasure to be able to talk about his work this evening. And um, uh, hopefully we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, it's been a very fascinating and unfolding story the last several months um, as we put the exhibit together and then uh, continued, as I've continued working on Gunnar's life story. So the, uh, let's see. So I was going to make this excuse, but I flew in from Chicago last night about 1 o'clock um, and slept until 5. So if I look dazed momentarily, that's why. Um, so anyway, the story, Gunnar's story in the United States begins in the 1920s. And during that time, when the European avant-garde ruled the art world and the rest of the world was caught up in great social and economic turmoil, one of America's greatest landscape artists went about his work here in the West and focused his passion and energy on painting the landscape that he fell in love with when he moved to the West. Swedish-born painter Gunnar Wiedforsch, and so for those of us who are Americans, uh, we can feel free to say Gunnar Wiedforsch, which is how it looks phonetically. But the correct pronunciation, and people always wonder about this, is Wiedforsch, with just a little bit of a sh on the end. Any um, Swedish descendants here in the audience? All right. Um, anyway, he, um, he spent 13 years of ceaseless activity, traveling the West, painting, um, selling his work, doing quite well, in fact, um, and documenting the beauty of the American West. He painted with determination to capture his vision, and then he died suddenly at the age of 55 at the south end of the Grand Canyon. Today, he's really known only to a very small, dedicated group of fans, uh, family members and descendants of his patrons and family members. And to those who happen upon his paintings in the national parks in the West where his work is on display, such as at Grand Canyon and Yosemite. Um, oops. Gunnar was born in Stockholm, Sweden on October 21st, 1879. He was the third of 13 children. This is a family photograph taken in 1895, and he's in the top left. This is his father, uh, Moritz, in the front left, and they look like a good Scandinavian family, don't they? Um, his father, Moritz, owned a, a hunting supply shop in Stockholm that sold firearms and leather outdoor wear. And Today, after a change of, actually two changes of hands, the company is still in business, known as H&M, or Hennis and Moritz. Uh, they don't sell firearms or hunting clothing anymore. They sell fashionable uh, young people's clothing. Um, and the, the, the shop just opened in um, Scottsdale, I think, just for, just for reference. Um, his mother, Glenda, in the bottom right over there, uh, was, a, was a painter and uh, was a 
noted, which means that something was written about it at some point, a noted amateur artist who attended the technical school in Stockholm, which is the college that the, uh, the arts and crafts college that Gunnar went to. And it was kind of more of a technical school than it was an art school. Uh, today, the college still exists, and, it's, uh, and it is kind of an art and design and craft school in, in Stockholm. He trained to become a painter, and specifically a decorative painter. He was going to be, uh, his, his, he kind of saw himself, his father saw him as being a muralist and doing you know, types of painting that today we would lump under the term faux finishing, you know, uh, painting fake marble and woodwork and that sort of thing. And after he graduated, he went to Pittsburgh for uh, about six months and returned back to Stockholm. I guess he, for whatever reason, didn't like doing decorative painting in, in Pittsburgh. And he came back to Stockholm and he told his father that he had plans to open his own painting business. And his father, who was very upright and you know, a good businessman himself, was pleased to hear that news. But after only a couple of months, Gunnar took off and began what became a, really a lifelong pattern of travel and leading kind of the classic bohemian lifestyle. Uh, he traveled about, earned enough money to pay his rent and buy food uh, by selling paintings. And then when he, uh, one anecdote says that when he had $25, he would move on and find new subjects to paint. This is a, a, an early European painting of his, a uh, painting of a forest outside Stockholm. And so one of, the, uh, one of the great things that has resulted from doing this exhibit uh, at the museum, uh, the first major exhibit of Gunnar's work in 40 years, one of the great things that's come about has been not just being able to pay homage to Gunnar and to, to put on display this great body of work, but also the network of connections uh, and, and correspondence that's grown as people have recognized the exhibit that we're doing at the museum and have contacted me and said, hey, I've got a Gunnar Weedforce painting and uh, you know, share the information with me. And the two greatest acquaintances I've made are uh, the grandson of Gunnar Wiedforsch, um, who, uh, that's a bit of a long story, but uh, we didn't know that he had a grandson until about three years ago. And the grandson himself didn't know he was the grandson until three years ago. Um, and they were just here uh, last week to view the exhibit, and they were very, very pleased and honored. Uh, and excited to see the exhibit. But then also I got a, um, via email just a couple of weeks ago, a great nephew of Gunnar, whose name is also Gunnar Bietforsch. And he sent, um, <clears throat> excuse me, he sent a uh, selection of uh, images of paintings that he owns on a CD that I uh, received a couple of weeks ago. And so I put in a selection of oh, maybe half a dozen paintings of European subjects that Gunnar did between roughly uh, 1900 and 1920. Um, and so this is all new work that's never been seen in the United States before. Um, and so I'm going to go through this kind of quickly, but I want, you to sh I want to show you the range of work that he was doing and, um, and the type of skill that he had at an early age. And um, so this is a, a work that uh, he, he liked harbor scenes, he liked trees, he liked buildings, uh, and he liked coast scenes, uh, as you'll see. So this is a wharf, and I'm not sure where it is, but um, anyway. Uh, street, uh, village street scene, he liked painted, painting village street scenes. And so he traveled throughout Europe. He preferred southern Europe, and he very much loved the Mediterranean. He painted a lot in the French Riviera, and he traveled to North Africa on several occasions. And if you're familiar with his work, you recognize his clarity, his great design, and his really vibrant color in these early pieces. And these, uh, these date go oh, from, let's say, about 1910 to 1920. And I, and I got these in the mail, like I said, about a week ago, and I couldn't wait to get home and pop them in the computer. And so for those of us who sometimes think he might be 